Ashley and Nora, and um, I'm proud to be a, you know, a member of Abundant Housing LA. Um, we've been ahead of the curve on thinking about the future of, of transforming how we care in low density areas. Our 2017 policy agenda calls for allowing for essentially four homes on single family lots close to transit in LA, and we support it um, efforts, efforts like that in all our plans and comments. Um, my background is Single-family zoning is essentially a century old, right? It's 100 years old, and for most of that century, it has um, been kind of an unquestioned centerpiece of how we plan cities, and also an unquestioned kind of value, central value of what the American dream, how people should live, what we should aspire to. And so, it's been exciting in the past few years to see that kind of this giant edifice this untouchable, kind of unquestionable centerpiece of how we live and how we plan cities, finally um, get some pushback. So pushback, uh, for example, uh, Minneapolis in late 2018 decided to allow three homes in every uh, piece of land in their city, probably the first city to undo single family zoning um, you know, in the United States. Cities like Portland and Seattle are, are considering doing the same thing in different parts of their um, city. We have SB 50 now sadly tabled, and another state bill in Oregon that would do the same thing. We have major publications and politicians discussing this issue. So it's, it's, it's risen to the top of kind of the planning agenda and the housing agenda, right? And so that's what matters is pushing that forward. But I wanted to take a step back and look at the origins of single family zoning to understand where it came from, um, whether it, you know, what were the motivations for it, how it arose. Um, and so this is kind of a it's sort of hard to see, I guess, on the screen. <laughs> I'm one of that, and so I'll describe it um, and fill it in. But basically, um, what we have here is kind of different. On this, I'll talk for a second about like where it happened, when it happened, and how it happened. And by how it happened, I mean what types of regulation kind of were brought together, put in the cauldron, stirred around, and out of it emerged the idea that you could only have one home for one family on a piece of property, right? That nothing else could be allowed there. Um, and so these colors are kind of different types of regulations that the originators of single family zoning used to, to, to push this forward. The blue one is kind of the centerpiece, is like the idea of to tell people what they can do on the property by defining what uses are allowed. And this power um, of local governments kind of was like a common law kind of nuisance, power to regulate what's considered nuisances, the kind of police power to regulate for safety and um, you know, the, the common good. And um, the, the kind of timeline of it, the trend of it, the way it developed, is there's, you know, for a long time there's been, re there's been regulations of kind of dangerous things, right? You can't, whatever, just have explosive, explosives, make explosives in your backyard or something. Um, but starting around 1880, in the West Coast cities, we started to have a very specific type of districts created where certain things were not allowed in certain parts of the city, but they were allowed in other parts of the city, right? And actually, the first, very first districting that happened in in San Francisco and Fresno and LA around 1880 was a limitation saying you can't, there's certain places you can't have laundries, right? Now laundries can be flammable, but they're a lot less flammable than many other types of industry. So why was, why were, why were California cities singling out laundries around 1880? Because of the people that usually worked in them? Well, they were run by Chinese yeah. immigrants, right? And so it was essentially a racist policy to get rid of businesses that employ Chinese. Um, and from that, you have a series of other types of use districts where like, you can't keep cows here, you can keep horses here, you can, you know, no cemeteries here or whatever. It comes out of this um, concern about this anti-Asian um, animus at the time. Um, a little bit after, around 1908, 1904 and 1908, the city of Los Angeles led the way in limiting a whole bunch of different types of industrial business uses and creating residence districts. And they first did these like case by case, like I live up in Northeast LA, there's one in Highland Park that was created around 1904, other parts of the city petitioned for them. And then in 1908, they created a system where you're either a residence district or you're a place where industry is allowed. And they split the entire city into either residence 
or places where you could also have industry. Um, the first place to ban apartments. So you might think, well, it makes sense again to 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 ban have, you know industry that's polluting and loud and dangerous from near some where someone lives. That makes sense. Uh, but the next step starts to go, you know, in a, in a different direction or a more sort of intrusive direction. And this is that in 1913, the state of Minnesota authorized its cities to limit districts to be only a one or a two unit home, only a single family house or a duplex. Minneapolis, the same year, took advantage of this and passed a rule, created the first district um, where only, where essentially apartments were banned, right? And so it's ironic and, and fitting, in a sense, that Minneapolis was then the first city in the United States to get rid of single family zoning. They're kind of making up from that sort of legacy in this. The first city that really had single family districts was Berkeley, which created an early zoning ordinance which allowed people to petition for certain types of restrictions. So they didn't go out and map the whole city like we do and say this is, but you could get 50% of the property owners to sign a petition and say, we want a, a district where only one, you know, one family homes are allowed. And that happened in six or seven districts um, shortly after that rule, um, making Berkeley probably the first place that had single family only districts. Um, in 1918, St. Louis and uh, Palo Alto, <coughs> Um, became the first city in the United States that actually created a zone map that included pre-existing, you know, determined by the planners, places where only single-family homes were allowed. In St. Louis, it was, it was kind of a fairly small part of the city, but it was, it was several of the, the wealthy, larger home districts. Um, Palo Alto and also Al Alameda the next year, zoned by the same guy, <coughs> Berkeley, most of the city was put in what we today call R1, or only single-family zones. Um, so you start to have a precedent that that a lot of the city should just be from the start to say nothing else can go in there. It's mainly homes now. It's not letting apartments in, no businesses, et cetera. Um, and then LA wasn't too far behind. 1921, <coughs> we passed an ordinance with five, five different districts. One of them was single family only. It was put up about you know, 10% of the city, but that was like 10 or 20 square miles. It was, a, it was a significant effort. So this is like the mainstream, the main line of how we got single family zoning. Just a reference, single family zones often also contain things like the minimum size of the property you need to have, or how tall the building could be, how big the house could be, that kind of stuff. That came out of, essentially out of um, building codes, right? The evolution of building codes, telling people don't do dangerous stuff in your house, and then creating districts where certain types of rules apply, and then eventually um, there started to be things like districts were only detached structure. Baltimore did that in 1912. You can only have a detached structure. It didn't tell you how many people or houses or kitchens or whatever you can have in it. So you can still like subdivide it internally to a duplex or something. But when you combine these two lines together, you essentially get what we have today is single family zones. <coughs> and then that's it. No. <laughs> so the green thing that's below that, just to say that single family zoning also borrowed heavily from private deed restrictions. So this happened when developers or property owners could essentially say, that running with the sale of the land is a restriction on your property that, that you couldn't do certain things with it. And this included things like you could only build a single family house on it, or it has to be, you have to spend $3,000 to build it, whatever. This was back, you know, way back in the 19th century. And also, it also included, you know, notoriously, the idea that certain people couldn't live there based on their race or ethnicity, or certain people couldn't buy, buy the property. And this was applied as early as. Um, 1843 in Massachusetts, there was a, a plot that prevented blacks and Irish from, from owning homes in that, and from living that property. Um, in the state of California, we started seeing anti-Chinese, anti-Asian sorts of covenants in the 1890s, and by the 20th century, you have very widespread use of covenants for African Americans, Latinos, Asians, Jews. Right. Um, and then there is also a kind of parallel racial zoning system that not many people know about. Um, and this was called residential segregation ordinances. It was pioneered in Baltimore in 1910-11. Richmond, next year, Louisville came soon <coughs> after Atlanta. And this was explicitly zoning based on race, saying that the first Baltimore ordinance was like, if 50% or more of a block have whites on it, no blacks can move in. And they also said if 50% or more of the residents of a block are black, no whites can move in. So it was explicitly segregating through essentially a districting system parallel to the type of zoning we started to see emerge at the same time. 
Now, in 1917, the Supreme Court of the United States ruled it unconstitutional based on a Louisville case. And the thing is, they didn't say it was unconstitutional because it's racist. They said it's perfectly appropriate to, to want to have the races segregated, but you're violating the civil right of the property owner to, to rent their property, often the white property owner. So it was a kind of weird, you know, that's just the way they, you know, the way they went back then. They didn't really care about the racist aspect, but the property rights aspect they grew upon. And so this kind of petered out. Although it's interesting that like Atlanta, a couple years later, they, they combined zoning and, and racist zoning and had things like R1C, like or, or R2W. So they had like R1 whites or you know or R3 colored zones. They're combining the type of zoning we have today with explicit racial categorization. That was thrown out again too. But they're in other words, southern cities would keep trying to do this. They, they wanted to somehow use zoning for this segregation of sin. And finally, just to mention that German cities had zoning starting in the 1890s. Didn't have as much single family zoning because it was in more urban areas, but US cities and planners were kind of influenced by this, and so they didn't invent this kind of system of different buildings, different places, housing <coughs> blocks. They also borrowed it from Germany. And then, I don't know if we advance to the, next, the final slide. And now I want to get to the question of why, which gets to the, the you know, why, why, did, why did this happen 100 years ago? Why did this happen, you know, 1915, 1916 in, in this century? And again, that's too small to see, so I'll kind of summarize it. Um, I mean, so the basic reason the research shows is that there was this explicit bias against people, renters, and against apartment houses. That planners thought they were incompatible with family life in a single family home, and so you wanted to keep out both the renters as a class of people and you want to keep out apartments as a structure. And the drafters of the early zoning ordinances were very explicit about this. Just to read from this, the guy, Charles Cheney, who's probably the most, in my mind, he's the number one originator of single family zoning in the US. He did the Berkeley, Alameda, Palo Alto, San Francisco, Portland, et cetera. He said, basically, that we need to follow this great principle protecting the home against the intrusion of the less desirable and floating renter class, right? So the idea is that you know, a male-headed household with a wife and kids is a stable family unit that's like the basis of civilization. You don't want these sketchy renters who are just moving in and out every few years or whatever. They're not married or something. They're, you know, who knows how they're living. You don't want them among your family. And similar argued logic comes from the um, uh, city attorney of Berkeley the same year when they're drafting the ordinance. Apartment houses are the bane of the owner of the single family dwelling. They shut out light and completely change the character of the neighborhood. So essentially they're using the same rhetoric that you hear in 1919. In fact, Berkeley is notorious for like someone getting up and saying, this, this apartment, this two story building is gonna block out my lights in my garden, my zucchinis will wither on the vine. <laughs> so you know, anyway, so it's the same, it's the same rhetoric, it's the same logic, and the same hidden idea that some people are not worthy. What year was that? Yeah, Sorry? This is exactly what's going on in Venice right now. Exactly. <laughs> right. What year was that? This is, a, this, is, this is 1950 in Berkeley as they're drafting the first okay. ordinance in the United States and the loudest thing that's going And courts sort of ratified this as a quote from an LA case. It was actually about duplexes, but they talked about single family. They basically stepped stuff out. You know, the logic for this, they justified the zoning based on the protection of the civic and social values of the American home. The home is intrinsic influence on the foundation of citizenship, blah, 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 blah. We've got to keep out the renters, right? The Supreme Court, notoriously in 1926, it ratified single family zoning um, in the case of Village of Euclid versus Ambler. And it basically said, um, basically, apartment houses, if you let the mail, it'll destroy the location for single family houses because good upstanding families will want to move out. Um, and the apartment house is essentially a parasite coming to that nice area that's created with single family homes. You know, it's good schools, it's good parks, it's good people, and then it's going to like suck the life out of it and destroy it, right? And I did want to include one quote from someone who objected back in this time. It's very rare. It's very hard to find people who are against this. Um, there's a social worker named Bruno Lasker, and he wrote an article called Unwalled Towns, in which he basically said, why would a democracy um, legislate a majority of its citizens, those who cannot afford to occupy an occupied house, a, a single family house, right? Why would you legislate them out of the best located parts of the city, practically always the parts with the best aspects best parts of the street, 
uh, best supply with municipal services and best cared for. So essentially, why would you keep people who don't have enough money for a single family home out of the nice parts of your, your town, right? This is from an article about, more broadly about segregation, but he made that point. Okay, so in the logic, it's single family zoning was to keep out the renter in the apartment. So the question is, was it also motivated by racism? And the answer is yes, but it's sort of complicated. It's not quite as direct. Um, so early zoning was all influenced in many ways by the anti-immigrant and the racial attitudes of the time. Um, racism was upsurge in the 1920s when this was happening. Um, essentially, you know, it was probably keeping people in their place. There's a lot of anti-immigrant, anti-black, anti-Asian <coughs> uh, in this. And then the regular, the stuff I showed in the last slide, the pieces that were put together to form single-family zoning, almost all of them have their sort of this kind of dark history in, or, in their origins. Like I said, the, the youth zoning came out of anti-Chinese stuff. Some of the building code stuff came out of kind of worry about immigrants overcrowding tenements in New York City and stuff like that. And you gotta you know, make them live a proper way. Um, the ra I, I mentioned that there's these this explicitly racist ordinances in southern cities around the same time, and it's. It's possible that when the Supreme Court made that illegal, you couldn't explicitly say blacks live here and white lives here, that kind of sing, family, single family zoning and zoning kind of filled the void. Now, I haven't found smoking gun on that. I think it's, it's kind of more likely that the, the people doing the zoning were kind of like aware of that and fine with that being the outcome of it, but they weren't explicitly saying, this is the way we sneak around the Supreme Court to get this in. Although we may, there may be some evidence I haven't found on that yet. And, and what's, what's obvious and what I think the other panelists will describe, is that single family zoning became a part of a kind of tapestry of racial discrimination in real estate and, and in, in places, right? So you had private deed restrictions, as I mentioned. Zoning made that public in a way, um, took a lot of those restrictions public. You had redlining and lending, you had racism, explicit racism and who could rent or, or buy property. You have, you know, all this other kind of legacy of a long 20th century and 21st century of of racism in real estate, and single family zoning was a big component of that. So the impact was to create more discrimination and segregation, even if there wasn't anything in the actual ordinance that was explicitly racist. So I'll stop there and look forward to hearing more. Thank Thank you, first and foremost, for having me. Um, am I clear to everyone? Is, can everyone hear and see me and we can connect? Fantastic. Um, Josh Tillard Gates, and I am the Senior Program Director for Policy at Enterprise Community Partners, which is an affordable housing nonprofit that's based in Columbia, Maryland. Um, our focus are um, 11 high cost housing markets in the country. We have a Southern California office, Northern California. We're in Miami, the Gulf Coast, and New Orleans. Um, Detroit, Chicago, New York, and uh, Washington, D.C. So we're, we're spread all out. We're trying to tackle some of these very issues. And that was a lovely presentation. And it actually segues perfectly into where I want to go with this. Um, you know, as was stated earlier, Enterprise right now is hosting an exhibit uh, called Undesigned the Red Line. It was actually created by a social impact firm based in Brooklyn, New York, by the name of um, Designing the We. And we've been hosting the exhibit since February. We'll be hosting it somewhere throughout Los Angeles County through the end of the year. Um, being the policy guy, I have some aspirations to house it at the Capitol at one point. Um, but right now it's located at the Los Angeles County Hall of Administration, right off the entrance uh, from Grand Park. And it'll be moving to the Los Angeles Central Library um, on one of their landings. I believe it's the business and economic um, economics landing at the library, and that'll begin on June 3rd. Um, so I'll just hop right into it, and I am gonna ask for a little bit of participation here. Um, so is anybody, who's familiar just with the term redlining? Show of hands. This is the best room I've ever been in, <laughs> by far. Um, outside of just the, the actual term and, and the word there, who can, who, has a, who thinks they have a really good understanding of what redlining actually is? 
Show of hands. Considerably less than our attorney up here, Scott. <laughs> All right, so that's that's great. Now you know I'm making this worth your time. So I want to start with the context of just the history of racism in this country, and I'll speed up till we get to where we need to be. But obviously, we have slavery in this country. Slaves are freed. We go through Reconstruction, and actually, a lot of the Southern slave states, um, the majority of the population were slaves. And for that very reason, a lot of the representatives in those states were black. Um, or African Americans, however you're comfortable saying it, I'm comfortable saying black, so I will. Um, so you have those representatives. Then you get the rise of the KKK, and you get things, and you get racist propaganda like the film of Birth of a Nation, which was screened by our president at the time. So those things start to happen, and now uh, you know these freed slaves, these black Americans are being prevented physically and by any other means from voting and from gaining that representation in public office. So those rates start to decline and eventually they have no representative um, that's looking out for their interests or that even looks like them. Um, we move forward uh, into the 1930s. We've dealt with the depression and we've got a lovely president who comes out with the New Deal. Everybody familiar with the New Deal? All right, great. So now that we have the New Deal, who can who and who loves history? Like I want to hear some of the uh, like some of the pitches for the New Deal. If anybody's got any, you know, like we're putting a chicken in every pot, like that sort of thing. You know what I mean? Like everybody's going to get some money. America's going to turn over a new leaf. Um, we're all going to do really, really well here, right? But there are two things that come out of the New Deal that didn't quite work out for everybody involved. Um, one part, and I, th I just find this fascinating and baffling at the same time. Social Security was created through New Deal programming, right? There were two occupations that were precluded from participating in Social Security. Can anybody guess what they are? I don't oh, it, <laughs> domestic workers and agricultural workers. Right, makes sense now, right? So we're here talking about racist policies and we're cutting out occupations that are, um, are occupied by you know, black Americans, immigrant Americans, Mexican Americans. Everybody that's essentially non-white is in that, are, are filling those roles and they're precluded from this great New Deal programming, right? The New Deal also creates something um, that we all would love to be able to utilize here in LA at some point in our lives, and that's a 30-year mortgage. So I love the timeline that you brought up a moment ago, and it shows how some of the zoning policies um, were, were skewed toward racial differences in terms of single family housing. But before the 1930s came around, you had to have the money to buy your house cash, or you had to have the money to build your house, period. There was no other way to do that. But during this time, the federal government put it upon themselves to say, we're going to lift Americans and, and then we're going to lift this economy and we're going to build uh, wealth in this country through home ownership. That is going to be our main mechanism of creating wealth in this country. Today, that still holds true. And this is essentially why it'll take us 300 years to close our wealth gap if, you know, minorities continue to gain at the pace they are and white Americans taper off. And so we all know that's not gonna happen. And so we have a long road ahead. Um, so going back to those policies that 30 year mortgage was created, you've had the recession and you've had all of these people in the real estate industry that are unemployed, right? You take these people, and when I say you, I mean the federal government. Federal government hires a lot of these former brokers, a lot of these former real estate agents, and they essentially take on the job of appraisals. Okay, they have a, uh, a federal housing, it wasn't the, was the F FHA or it wasn't HUD at the time. Um, it actually was by the name, I do need a few notes here. Um, doesn't say not that important. <laughs> <laughs> federal housing agency um, that's, that's, you know, in existence at this time. And they create this manual that these appraisers follow in various cities throughout this country. So um, New York, our exhibit actually maps out New York but um, to explain redlining, but it is an LA-based exhibit. So there are LA maps uh, from the 30s. And they go around to these neighborhoods and they're to be looking for key things 
to determine whether or not a bank or financial institution is going to issue that mortgage. And so the federal government will secure that mortgage, right? So the types of areas, and they're rated on you know, a grade scale from A to D, A being high, D being low. And then on a color scale, it was going from green to blue to yellow to red, red being the absolute worst. So we go back again, we're in the 30s, and these people are going around and they're following the manual. This is federal guidelines, this is history, um, not being objective in this point of the presentation. And as they follow this procedure, they look at an area that has uh, a majority of white uh, you know, uh, inhabitants of the neighborhood. The neighborhood's majority white. Uh, generally, it's the man in the household working. Uh, the man of the house is in a white collar job. He could be working on Wall Street. He could be a, a business owner. Uh, he could be a doctor, could be a lawyer, white collar, white professional man. This is the perfect area. Every bank in the country is going to insure a mortgage there. So if you fit into that category, you can go buy a home, you can utilize your 30 year mortgage. Your family begins to create wealth in the 1930s. That is going to be able to support them today, right? We go on the reverse end of that. If I go into an area and it says, you know, the majority of the of the population is, is black or immigrant or uh, Latin American, I have to look what the guideline says, and it says that I actually need to write down um, phrases and terms like Negro infiltration and um, outside forces or hostile forces. You know, this is where we're we're describing this like we would war at, to, to a certain degree. And so when we grade this place, this is going to be a D. This area is going to be red, and there's no shot that these people will get a mortgage. So now these people are forced to rent, okay? So now we, we essentially, again, to your point and with the zoning here, we, we've kind of pumped that up. We put it on a federal basis. So now we're issuing 30-year-old, 30 30-year 30 mortgages to our white, white-collar workers, even our white, blue-collar workers. And, and trust me, the white, white-collar workers are never living, bordering an area that has been redlined. And there's a very real reason for that, um, aside from the blatant racism. These redlined areas begin to become slums. And everybody that can take advantage of this single-family home, this 30-year mortgage, they do so. I can't fault them for that. I would love a 30-year mortgage now if I could afford it in this beautiful city. But I can't, like most people there. So they're moving out of these neighborhoods. Maybe it's an apartment building, maybe a single family. You know, Maybe it's even a little diverse at some point. But now they're thinking, oh, I could buy a home. My family would like a home. The government's going to support me in this. This is my opportunity to do it. They take advantage of that. Now the tax base leaves. So now that the tax base leaves, to your point, with um, why would we preclude people from living in an area that had better public services, better sidewalks, better parks, better schools, better libraries, better utility systems? We, I could beat around the bush on why they would do it, but the history books say they did it because they didn't want black, brown, and immigrant populations living next to white people. So. Again, going back to the neighborhood, the slum that has been created, now their tax base leaves, right? So you have cities all over this country. LA's not precluded from this. Um, I'm from Kansas City, Missouri originally. I can see it today. Um, you can still see it in the Bronx. The Bronx in New York was a completely redlined area. It was, um, it was zoned green, which would have been that they would have been able to get that 30 year mortgage, Westchester County. As you get towards upstate, where a lot of um, the investment bankers live, you get closer to the Connecticut border, a lot of that was zoned for housing, and those people still own those homes, okay? So you lose your tax base, you lose your services, and this is still, again, in one city. So what happens when there are two fires in one fire truck? Where does the fire truck go? Exactly. And there's no tax base. So at one point, you've got 80% of the rocks almost burning down. To the ground. It's hard to believe that a city like New York would allow that to happen today. I just think it's far too much money there, it's far too much real estate, and some of that stems from these policies. Um, gentr we'll move forward a little bit to how this allowed for gentrification in areas. 
okay? So you've got these red line policies, red lining maps created again, every major city throughout the country. And you've subsidized these suburbs. Now they're incentives. The federal government's got all these programs. They're even issuing um, better loan terms. Um, even veterans that come back are still affected by these. Black veterans can't buy that home. White veterans can. So they go buy a home for $10,000. Um, you know, a $10,000 home in, in Venice, you know, 100 years ago is worth millions of dollars today. And again, that takes us directly to the wealth gap. Because the whole point of a mortgage at the time was to create wealth from America, um, for Americans. The problem is, is that we don't often acknowledge that that programming and that history was designed for a specific group of Americans and for not all Americans. And so we read about the New Deal and we think it's a really great program. And some aspects of it were, but some aspects of that were really, really, really harmful. And so you have these slum areas, there, there's disinvestment, you know, it, the property values are low so you can build highways through it. You can acquire the land. Um, the city and the states and governments, you've got the interstate system. You create that. Well, it's a lot easier to get the interstate system for um, low-valued land that people don't own and they're just renting from than it is to tear down a bunch of single-family homes in the suburbs. So that's what begins to happen. And you continue to look at L.A. and you look where our highways are and you look where they go through. You know, we can't, we can't even get a train through uh, Beverly Hills. You know, and, and it's, it's a very obvious reason for that. Um, shameless plug, if you go view our exhibit, Beverly Hills then was zoned green. That was almost 100 years ago. It hasn't changed. South L.A. was zoned red. Skid Row was redlined. East L.A. was redlined. All of these places were redlined. But as we, as we move through, we, we're out of the 30s, you know, World War II. People are coming back. They need jobs. We keep, we keep pressing. Some of these things are outlined, but again, to a point that you brought up, are outlawed. Um, but then we have racial covenants in deeds. And the beautiful thing about a deed is that you add to it, you don't erase from it. So you can pull deeds today in certain areas of this city and they will say, you know, you cannot, cannot sell to a, a black person, you cannot sell to an immigrant, you cannot sell to a Jew, you cannot sell to all these groups of people. Right? And it's an it's a ugly part of our history, but I think in living in a place like L.A. and everybody in here, you're, you're here, you're part of this conversation, and so your hearts and minds, I have to assume, are in the right place. And it's hard to believe that in a place you know, like this, um, these things were happening. You know, it, wasn't, it wasn't just Jim Crow South. It wasn't uh, in you know, the backwoods of Louisiana. This happened in sunny California, from the top of the state to the bottom of the state. And moving to the single family housing, how much does a single family house cost in Los Angeles? Forget the zoning part of it. How much does it cost? Like how much does it cost to rent? Oh, uh, renting, a, renting an apartment, I think, the, I think the average apartment here now is around 2,500 bucks. You guys probably would know a little bit better than I, but I think it's about $2,500. That is, that causes many and most Angelinos to be severely rent burdened. And in fact, um, Zillow just put out a report that says that LA is actually painfully expensive to live in because the median income here is only 60,000, but or about 65,000, but we're on the high end of housing. And when you factor in what the wages are here, we actually have the most expensive housing in the country. Housing is more expensive in New York City, but people make more money in New York City. Same goes for San Francisco, same goes for Washington, D.C., same goes for, I think, Boston. But here, people are not earning those wages, but the, but the cost of housing is continuing to escalate. So moving to the, the NIMBY conversation, I caution anybody that takes that stance that if you're not a millionaire or are planning on becoming one very, very quickly, um, you know, ta with tangible plans here, um, you might want to switch sides because at this pace, that is really what it's going to take to live here comfortably and to be able to enjoy um, this city that, you know, we, we know has some beautiful things to offer. 
Um, but but wrapping up and you know moving on to our next panelist, I just wanna I wanna one remind everyone in this room that we can look out on this homeless population, and we're not far from it. Um, homeless count's gonna come out in a couple weeks, and you know last year I think we had a, just over uh, fifty thousand homeless people on our streets. Um, about seventy five percent of them are unsheltered. So we're talking 38,000 people um, sleeping on the street. Those are the ones you can count. I don't know how you could ever say that's an exact number. So I'm sure the numbers are off a little bit. And the interesting part of that is 9% of LA County's population as a whole is African American, but 40% of its population, of the homeless population, is African American. And the reason for that stems back to discriminatory housing policies that don't allow for wealth creation. And it doesn't just affect black people, it affects all minorities, it affects some white people. But the problem is, is these people were never allowed to create wealth. They were not allowed to build wealth. Everybody has a hard time at some point in their life, whether it's before college, right after college, mid-30s, divorce, who knows? There, there are plenty of reasons why we go through the things that we go through. But there are some people that are able to call mom, dad, cousin, sister, brother, and there are some people that simply aren't. And it's not an accident. It was a federal design. Um, it's, it's in the history books, if you do the research. And so that's, the, that's the, the cautionary tale. So I would just use that information to remind you that you know, when, we, when we see people that are becoming homeless at, a, at an alarming rate, people with jobs becoming homeless, and, and people that can't afford to live in this city, that have been living in this city for generations, it's, it's the result of very, very intentional actions uh, by, our, by our federal government. And you know there are a lot of organizations like yourself and like Enterprise um, that are working to undo some of these systematic ills that we have in this nation um, and in this city. And it's really going to take a massive effort um, from the grassroots level, from the policy level, from the policy makers level. And with that, I will leave it to the next panelist. Thank you. South Central Los Angeles, lived around the city, and um, decided to have my foray in single family real estate in the mid to late 90s. I'm gonna kind of, I wanted to compress that because the reason that I, um, I'm mentioning the, the, the panelists, because you have a, a, the legal side of it, you have the policy side of it, and then you have the boots on the ground dealing with the single family transition. I mean, I probably, thousands of homes, bought and sold thousands of homes, with groups, with smaller groups, small partnerships, larger partnerships, and 90, probably 80 to 90% of the activity was in the Red Line District. Uh, the Red Line District in Los Angeles is pretty much from maybe Rosecrans going south, all the way to probably the 10 freeway going north, mm, Crenshaw going west, to Central Avenue going east. So there's a block, there's a, if you look at a map, and the way that Los Angeles is designed is very you know, grid friendly. And that was 80 to 90% of my activity from 1998 until you know, I did the, the second run of activity in the crash of 2008, but I, did, I made a run of activity from 2008 to 2015 pretty much. So um, I say all that to just, you know, give the discussion more layers. And the layers that I bring to the table are, I'm buying homes in these areas. I'm seeing the, the, the um, effects of, um, of 
bad mortgages being handed out to the, um, the inhabitants. I'm seeing um, different types of allowances for different areas that distinctly affect the value. I mean, you have a church, a payday loan place, a liquor store, and an auto body shop. And then when the, the appraiser comes to, to um, well, first of all, that affects living conditions in the community. But when the appraiser comes to, to value the home for the mortgage, for the, the, uh, the, the homeowner, it, it greatly affects it. And the way that LA is kind of organized is you go block, I mean, I'm sorry, you go a mile or two west and it's a different, it's an entirely different neighborhood. So I would always wonder, what, how, how did this happen? I mean, you did a great job, Mark, to uh, you know, put uh, you know, the, the, the history together. I, I, didn't, I didn't know how it happened. I'm just operating in the area and when I see these blighted areas, you know, it's opportunistic for a business owner. Um, and what would happen is I would use that opportunity to, to my advantage and it, it, would, it brought investors to me. They would ask my group, how do you know what to do and how to do it in these areas? And, you know, it was kind of instinctive because of my experience, but it also, also saw the difference in the areas. I knew that I could get away with things, and I'll give an example in a moment. I knew I could get away with things on 48th and Central that I couldn't get away with, and I've owned homes in Bel Air. I, I just couldn't get away with the zoning. And what, how that was affected was because of the, um, the uh, inspectors, city inspectors. Those were the police. Those were the advocates of the enclaves that were created throughout the, the, the city and the neighborhoods. So you would have an inspector come sign off on your on your, your rehab project, and the rehab project would, it would be different than in different parts of the city. One example I have is on 48th and Central, I remember I, I, I bought a home, the home was vacant and it was just, you know, it was, it was in disrepair. I, I bought it and I looked and I saw an extra large garage and I said, you know what, I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna talk to my contractor, brought my contractor back there. The contractor said, um, you said there's some uh, plumbing that you can tap into. You said there's an electrical um, you know, feed right here. You said this structure is, is kind of, you know, um, it, 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 could, it could be turned into a home. So I did, I turned it into a home because now I've t had one home on an on a ordinary lot to two homes. And I made that added value play and I sold the home. But the, the steps that I had to take during the sign-off process were very interesting. And those steps were, I would call for the inspections, I called for the inspections, I called for the inspections. And when I called the final inspection, or it's, you know, maybe second to third to the last final inspection, the inspector saw what I was doing. And he said, um, you're building another home back here. I said, well, yeah, you know, it's a casita. It's, you know, it's, 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 it's kind of a you know, little home. I tried to, you know you gotta play with the guys because you know if they don't sign off, you don't have a certificate of occupancy, you don't get, a, the, the new buyer doesn't get a loan on the property, you just lost a lot of money, or you may even have to tear it down. So the bottom line was, we talked about it, and he eventually signed off. And, and silly of me, I, I said, you know, whatever the guy's name, I said, why did you sign off on this zoning as a single family um, zoned residence to a duplex, a two, on a, two homes on a lot? He says, well, it looks like everything else around here. <laughs> yeah, that's it. I said, that's it. That's it. You know, I mean, and that the 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 difference. It's it's so it makes so much difference with the inspectors, with the legacy of single family zoning. With the um, I don't want to. I'm not a racism advocate for single family, but I'm a. I see the experience, so it it makes so much sense to. When, when you notice the differences and you see how it affects the residents of the areas, the zoning, the sign-offs, the layout. Now, if I would have um, done the same thing in Redondo Beach, there's homes and ordinary lots in Redondo Beach, and if I were, if I were to try to uh, create more density there with multiple homes and a lot, I mean, I was in the paper today, I sent an, uh, an article to Lenora, this is in Connecticut. The picket, fit, the picket signs would have come up in the city hall in Redondo Beach because not in my backyard is, is at play. So, you know, my, my presentation is more opening it up to questions and what would be, you know, why, what would happen on the ground in my neighborhood to, you know, to affect these, these, these changes and, and as a business owner, I've seen 
one more thing I'd like to um, bring up. How I met Leonora is, it was a UCLA event at the Luskin um, Center, and it was called Livable LA. And they had mayors of cities, um, citizens displaced by um, the, you know, the, the housing costs in their neighborhoods. They had um, policymakers. It was just a lot of, a lot of people there. And I approached the stage because the panelists that Leonora was on, you know, it interests me. But as I, I approached the stage, I kind of got roped into a conversation of a single, there was an elderly white lady who was adamant about the fact that single family housing zoning is racist. She said, that cannot be. It just can't be. But she, this, she's saying this with a not in my backyard attitude. She's saying this without reading the deeds of, of the legacy of, um, records in, in, uh, in housing. She's saying this by, and she was a transplant. She may have moved from Virginia to Los Angeles, and then her mobility as a single elderly white female, she, you know, she may have moved to Chevy Hills and had the benefits of that neighborhood, the libraries, the, 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 the parks, the, you know, the, whatever the, is, is in that neighborhood that um, is to be showcased in the city versus not to say that this would happen, but in certain times it did, versus a black or a Latino lady that would move in the 1970s, they're moving straight to South Central because you couldn't move anywhere else. Now, the mobility of, of that area and the, what that area offered was just different. And the, the lady that I got into the conversation with, she couldn't understand that. And I was trying to explain it to her. I don't, I'm not a policymaker. I'm not... Uh, you know, a legal expert, I was trying to explain to her, listen, this is a part of the fabric of this, this city. It's not bad or good, it's just what is. And unless we change the narrative and change the conversation of what's an all-inclusive way to, to have housing? What are, what are some, anecdote, uh, what are some um, solutions to, to the housing crisis in Los Angeles? What are some density issues? What are some transportation issues? What are some homeless issues? Unless we re you know, elevate that conversation, we still have this 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 narrative of not in my backyard or or, or this is not, there's not even an issue here. That was her her her, her stance. There's not an, there's there's no issue here. So, uh, with that being said, I um, give it back to Leonora. Thank you so much. Thank you. I'm gonna take the Q and A portion of this now. So I'm gonna invite Rebecca, our uh, hearing representative, up to moderate the Q and A portion of this and. You know, maybe you could just um, tell everybody a bit about yourself, your background, and um, you know, and and just the recent successes that you've had as our hearing representative. So, uh, before she speaks, Rebecca has already successfully advocated for two affordable housing projects for families and seniors, and she also got to meet with um, County Supervisor Solis to talk about housing. So. Um, She's an example of how you can make a difference just as, a, as one individual person, you can have a huge impact on, um, on the things that get approved and the conversations that are happening in LA. So why don't you um, take it away and we'll bring you, um, oh, and make sure you write down your questions on the cards. We're gonna be passing those out. So um, just take a moment and think of your questions and write them down and we'll collect those. As she said, my name is Rebecca Mooley. I started volunteering about a week or two ago. And I've been to, <laughs> I know, I'm so new. The first thing I went to was a training, and then the next day was a board of supervisors like hearing for affordable housing that I went to, so it's really quick. So like she said, I went to that for board of supervisors. It passed, thankfully, for LA affordable housing, and also two days ago for Venice, affordable housing for seniors and for Seniors and also, what was it, Leonora? Um, the one in Venice was, uh, that was the Thatcher Yard project. Thatcher Yard project. It, yeah, it was family and senior uh, affordable Family housing. and senior. And that passed as well, which we were really happy about and surprised, but mostly happy. And yeah, I live in Moreno Valley, California. Does anyone know where Moreno Valley is? It's up there. It's before Riverside. It's after. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's a I, live, freeway, yeah, I right. live really close to like Beaumont, Palm Springs, so that's where I was yeah. coming from. But even just being a SoCal native, like growing up 
born and raised here, but mostly in the Empire. I've been reading about the homelessness epidemic here in LA. Every time I check, it just goes up and up and up and up. And it's like terrifying that no one is even like, well, no one who's like working and signing things off, city council and all that, are bringing more attention to it. So I just made the decision online to find any nonprofit organization that just helps with these things and what we can do and what initiatives we can um, support to make sure that it's getting done. So that's how I came across Abundant Housing LA and it's been awesome. Yeah, thanks so much, Rebecca. Um, here's some third question. So um, yeah, why don't you start reading those off to the panel? Okay, the first question I have, panel, what would you say to someone that said that even though single family zoning has exclusionary roots, it is still worth keeping today to protect and promote home ownership. I, guess, uh, no. <laughs> I, 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 I'll take that question. So if, I just want to make sure I understand it. Um, even though this has a legacy of the, the single family zoning has a, a negative legacy or the intention, you know, should we still promote single family ownership? Yeah, they're worth keeping and protecting, yeah. It's worth, well, just like anything, it's, it's worth an update. Um, it's worth an update to, I'm looking at it, Josh talked about building wealth. And I have a, you know, a, a blog that I kind of answer some, some questions on about owning versus renting. And the new, you know, the new professional, the new millennial, and this new shared economy. So. Is single family zoning worth um, preserving? Yes, but the updated conversation needs to, to take place. Is it a, a wealth building mechanism? Is it um, you know, promoting uh, inclusion or exclusion? Is it addressing the density that cities are now facing? And if it's addressing and, and being, you know, being updated, it could be preserved but updated. Well, I mean, you know, thinking about updating it, you have to distinguish between single family zoning, which is the rules about what you can do on a property, and a single family house, right? Or owning versus renting, because they're somewhat, they're different. And you said we don't want traditional single family zoning. That doesn't mean there shouldn't be a lot of detached houses in LA. It doesn't mean we don't want people to own or have a choice of renting or owning based on what they can afford or what they like. In our mind, it creates more diverse options of ways to live and options to live and people in the neighborhood if you have a range of small types of housing in the same street in the same neighborhood. And in fact, if you look at this report um, that I did certainly with uh, Lewis Center UCLA, with Maddie here, it's kind of about um, the history and future of why we used to have diverse types of housing in LA, like duplexes, bungalow courts, fourplexes, right next to a single family house, right next to a two story apartment building, and that kind of went away, and we're really talking about bringing it back. And you can have a fourplex that people own the four units, like a you know, small lot subdivision. You can have a fourplex that people, one person owns and rents the other three to pay their mortgage, right? You can have a whole different mix of types of properties. So just because you don't have strict single family zoning doesn't mean that people can buy if they want to. In fact, they'll have more choice about what to do. I, I guess I'm uh, on the spot for an answer. <laughs> um, I, I do agree with um, updating it, and I do agree with um, retaining uh, some options and some choices in housing and, you know, the types of housing and renting versus owning and that sort of conversation. Um, like, like anything, I think you, you need to get, when, when there are two sides, you need to find a way to get closer to the middle on that. Um, we have to understand that there are certain systems um, in this country that are that are designed in a way that um, encourage behavior. Um, essentially, our, our system of taxation is, is designed to encourage or dissuade certain types of behavior. So we can't we can't embrace that, and that's a whole another conversation, which makes this a bit of a loaded question, but I still like it. Um, but we also have to understand that California in this country is really a housing. So in times like these, um, I think there have to be some tough decisions made. And I think the decision makers have to 
to maybe do some things that may not get them voted back in office in their in their district or in their neighborhood. Uh, but they really need to start um, taking a human approach to this, um, simply because we just don't have enough votes. So I would love it if everybody had the option to choose between, you know, a nice big house for themselves or a bungalow or you know to share a duplex or to live in a condo or to live in an apartment. But the reality is, is that we're over 500,000 units short in Los Angeles County. And at that number, we just need more. And hopefully we can preserve some of those options. But if at some point we have to, you know, in a, in a way, ask for forgiveness later, that just may be the way we need to go. Okay, next question is, redlining was used to restrict which neighborhoods receive mortgages? Do we still see neighborhood-based discrimination in lending today? Are there alternative forms of lending financing that might be able to circumvent such problems? I can answer that two as well. well, well two there's two and one. Well, yeah. I'm going to answer the. I'm going to address the, the second part. Are there other um, other options? Yeah. The answer. The short answer is no. FHA is the largest mortgage holder for homes and apartment buildings in the world, pretty much, uh, especially you know here in the North, in North America. And there may be some alternatives, but if your mortgage isn't um, backed by the federal government, then you know the, ch the chances of, of, of it being a reasonable rate and you know making sense for, for you economically is, is probably not an option. So th that's to address the is there another option? Um, and, and what was the first part? The first of one was, do we still see neighborhood-based discrimination in lending today? Yes. The funny thing is, I would, okay, in, there's different parts of, of uh, the process of repositioning homes. And by the way, uh, my, the repositioning of homes was my activity in the first part of my career, and then the second, my career continued into multifamily. And it's funny that the multifamily uh, population and families that I, I, I dealt with, they transitioned between the two types of products that um, I, I've been involved with. But, um, so you have, you have, um, wait, what was the question? <laughs> <laughs> Do we still see neighborhood-based discrimination in lending today? Lending. In lending. Yes. So, the reason I say that is because when, when someone is qualifying to buy a home that I, I'm, I'm purchasing, I'm looking at everything. Financials, I'm looking at who's qualifying, what type of families, you know, how many, how much deposit did they put down? I remember in the 90s, it was, it was, there were, had the predatory lending practices and, and all of the signs on my house that said, Milinganche, Milinganche. I remember that because $1,000 down, $1,000 down for the first or second generation Latino family coming from Guatemala, Mexico, El Salvador. And you wanted these catchy phrases to get them into these predatory lending pro, uh, uh, products. And this discriminatory lending was the fees attached to the loans and the types of loans, these hybrid, I don't even want to call them hybrid, these bad loans that were, were, were given to the, to, to the families that were buying the homes that I, I repositioned. Um, $1,000 down to buy a $500,000 duplex. That's not financially responsible. Um, PMI, the, the, um, the mortgage insurance, you're charging 2% mortgage insurance. If you bought a home in Redondo Beach and the mortgage, you know, you're at Chase Bank, there is no mortgage insurance. The mortgage insurance is the fact that you put 20% down. You have, you have 20% in the game, skin in the game. So predatory lending practices are, are they're alive and, you know, and, and active today. Any other hand? Yes. Move on. I think that was the first question. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Next question. Does the fact that LA County has so many different municipalities, oh my God, municipalities make it make addressing these issues easier or harder I'll take this <laughs> um, yes is the short answer um, but the, the problem with or I wouldn't say the problem but the difficulty with having so many different municipalities and unincorporated areas um, of a state and a city that's well, first of all, a city that's so diverse and of a state that's so diverse is that 
um, the decision makers are doing what they feel is best for their community, and they are doing things in a way that um, is protecting the interests of their constituents. Um, but as we know, the constituency in this city changes at an instant from one block to another. Mm -hmm. And so the fact that Santa Monica is its own municipality and Burbank is its own municipality, as is West Hollywood and Beverly Hills and Compton and the city of LA and the surrounding areas, um, they all are gonna have different housing standards. They all have different uh, they all have different housing requirements. They all approach affordable housing in a different way. And when you have certain bills at the state level, like Senate Bill 50, um, when you get into the technicalities of a bill and um, the, the rates uh, for AMI and um, the affordability requirements and how high they are and what type of benefits you're retaining, the numbers are so, they're so convoluted and they're so complex at that policy level that you could be, you know, the difference of three percentage points between the state level um, practice and what's in West Hollywood can mean that West Hollywood can't avail itself to the same benefits that a Santa Monica could, even though Santa Monica has no interest in using it. You know, and, th and not to say that that's a, a fact, but just giving an example of using a familiar name. And so all of those municipalities, just having it does make because everybody has a specific interest. I live downtown, I don't care how high they build, I would love it if they built more homeless shelters, please in my backyard, I would love it, right? But in Santa Monica, they're building your height requirements because you can't restrict the use of speech. I understand it to a degree, but when 35,000 people are sleeping on the street, then maybe we find another way to look at the beach. <laughs> um, it's, it's just, it, it really is just the way, um, it just makes the conversation a lot more convoluted, a lot more complex. Um, we're working again with a very diverse population, several municipalities, we have incorporated cities, unincorporated areas, some cities don't have enough money for public services or for some of these, um, some of these other things that affect housing and the health there, so, you know, it layers the conversation to a point where we're having meetings like this trying to figure out how to fix it. Sorry if I, you know. I agree, we need, spoke. we need more state <laughs> regional control because you don't want, you want cities to be able to represent their public, but you don't want cities to be able to exclude different people or new people from being able to live there. And so if you have some state standards, hopefully you allow the good part of liberal democracy without the exclusion. is what would it look like for a neighborhood to have an equitable distri distribution of housing for people of all racial and economic backgrounds? That's the first one. Number two, what would have to change to achieve that? Be it a policy change, a social change, or anything else? I'll go with that one too, because it's actually something that I think about quite often. And I think for something like that to take place, it would have to, I don't know what it looks like, I haven't seen it. But in order for that to occur, the hearts and minds of almost every Angelino has to change. They all have to get closer to the same point where we have the same priority, and that is prioritizing housing for everybody and not, and, and not making it a privilege, um, making it a, a right, making it an understanding that when you live in a city, when you live in this country, you do have some place to stay. Um, sure, there's going to be some variation there, but that people all have homes and a roof over their heads and some shelter, I think is going to take changing, again, hearts and minds of people, because when that changes, then those people from a, a bottom-up level through local government, through policy change, can then demand those things from their policy makers and all these different I'd, lo I'd like to add to that because um, the hearts and minds of the citizens, of course, is the, the main um, driver to, to push things. But you know, just looking at it as a as the market, what would incentivize a business owner to put together a neighborhood or put together a piece of property or a neighborhood that addresses density, that addresses diversity, 
that addresses transportation, that addresses walkability. You know, they're, they're, from the New Deal to, you know, the TARP, there's always been lending um, rules and, 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 and levers to motivate. I mean, the last one was the, all the quantitative easing that happened over the, after the, the crash. So, you know, I'm looking at it as a, a market driver. What market drivers would, would incentivize developers, um, real estate owners, single family owners to put an eclectic uh, neighborhood together you know, this, you know what, what, would, what would it look like behind the business? Tax credits, interest rates, um, you know, educational um, uh, credits for, for different areas because schools are such a, a big part of, um, of where, why people move to different areas. So I think it's a, a blended approach from the people and also through some type of lending business incentives. I mean, in, in some ways, that's what finding housing LA is about, and it's obviously tremendously difficult. The subject we're talking about today is important because if you allow apartments, small apartments, or medium-sized apartments to be built where only single-family homes are, are allowed today, you essentially allowed a, you allow a group of working class or middle class people to have a chance of outbidding upper class people for that property in a weird way. Mm -hmm. Now that's just a start though. That, that helps a little bit, you get more different types of housing as we, as we discussed, but it doesn't eliminate the vast inequality we have in the society in LA County based on race, based on class, based on immigration. Um, so you also need subsidies for people who cannot afford the rent or some other way of modulating prices. You need to try to figure out how to have um, affordable housing in places where the land is expensive, whether that's exclusionary zoning in the private sector, whether we follow best practices of social housing from other countries where the actual, the federal <coughs> government and the state government actually fund homes that everyone lives in. So you don't just have affordable housing for the poor that kind of does micro segregation in certain areas. So there's a whole host of more successful ways of doing things. And we've kind of just fallen for this trap of making it hard to build anything, mm -hmm. starving ourselves through Prop 13 so we can't fund mm -hmm. housing for the poor. And then we just, yeah, our leaders say we can't do anything, right? And so. We have to, as a public demand, we do more and do better, and slowly with more people around the table, we'll hopefully do that. Staff's question. Fastly, we'll do that. We'll right. <laughs> Fastly, yeah. yeah. Okay. The next question. Oftentimes, single family zoning was chosen by the people living in a given neighborhood. What would make them change their minds to allow more people into their neighborhood? Are there alternatives to changing their minds? Um, as a as a as an Angelino that you know my parents were here during the Watts riots. I was here during the the, the 90s, the riots with the Rodney King and you know the O.J. Simpson uh, verdict right here downtown. One of the things I've observed is living in a progressive city in a progressive state, so to speak. A lot of people don't like to admit. They're racist. I, you know, I have racist tendencies of, or prejudice tendencies because of the way that I've, you know, experienced the world. But are my prejudice tend tendencies marginalizing a group of people? And the conversation that I was involved with at the Luskin when I met Leonora was, I, I need to admit that I'm something is wrong. I, I need to admit that how I move around and the way that I live in my home and and I bought my single family house has a legacy of racism. It's almost like being, you know, an addict. I, I've participated in the prejudice that marginalizes other people living in my area. And that doesn't happen a lot. So this conversation is, is, is great because I've learned a lot from it and it opens the eyes to the first step, which is something is wrong that is marginalizing a group of people and how they are able to live and where they are able to live. And, and you know, that's a, that's a start. One, one way of thinking about it, what kind of conversation can get people to change their mind a little bit? So, and I think some of our members have been doing that in different neighborhoods and probably some of you have too. So things like, if the population that is living in single family homes is older, you might talk to them about where their grandkids or kids are gonna live or would they wanna have more 
neighbors in the community as they get older and need assistance with things, or do they want enough people in the community, there can be a coffee shop close by so they don't have to get in their car when they're too old to drive. So just kind of talking to people about the benefits that a slight, slight small changes happen. You can say the houses will still look the same, we just you might split it in half and there'll be two families there rather than one. And now there are young kids again in the neighborhood, and that's fun. You know, so there's, you know, there's these kinds of things. But ultimately, because of the crisis, you also say, you know, you don't get to choose what your neighbor does mm -hmm. if there's a small apartment there or not. Essentially, you, you know, we vetoed other people, different people, from being here for too long, for 100 years, and that's coming to an end, and you're gonna probably enjoy it, but you have some fear, but it's through you, you know? So <laughs> you know that's, 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 that's the, that's the carrot and stick. Next question. Have you seen any poor examples of redevelopment of land? For example, large luxury apartments, gentrification, higher commercial rents, etc. Yes. <laughs> well, I'm. Uh, yeah. I'm. But I'm. Does SB50 address those things? That's a question. Sorry. I didn't so. Well, okay. Sorry. You know, I'm. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. Okay. Okay. Just an answer to SB50. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll answer. I'll. I don't want to answer the SB. I don't. I may answer the SB50, but let me let me start here. <laughs> I've seen some things. Some things that are. Um, Daniel and I were talking about a, a development in Culver City off of. Uh, we're near Culver City, off of La Cienega and Jefferson. I actually lived there, uh, near there when I was a kid, and it's, it's changed for the better. There's, a, there's an expo line there, there's density there, there's two main thoroughfares that can get people in and out. You know, you can get to the south through the La Cienega um, um, kind of a highway, you can get to the north, you can get east to west through the expo line. So, you know, I think they're building 2,000 homes there, 2,000 units. I think that's successful. And I've seen some, some, you know, some that weren't successful. As I was in um, bidding on a, a deal in Van Nuys, you know, just a, I call them, um, you know, stucco bricks or stucco boxes. That's just my, my name when I when I know that they took the cheapest route to put a product out up to pass it on to the next investor. And in my line of work, sometimes activity is better than quality. So if you have a fund and you have to deploy it in a development project, you'd rather just deploy it so you can have that track record versus building something quality and, 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 and you need it. So that's what I wanted to say about the first question. The SB 51, I'll leave. Um, I'll leave you know, I am, I will high level SB 50 um, simply because Enterprise has I will, the, the high level read I'll give on SB50 is that um, I, I firmly believe that the author and the, um, the party that are moving the bill or attempting to move the bill have their hearts in the right place. Um, they want to do the right thing, uh, but I am aware as are they of a lot of um, groups and organizations Southern California that have some real concerns about the bill. Um, to my knowledge and all the conversations that I've had throughout the state, uh, nobody believes that we shouldn't be building more housing. Nobody believes that we shouldn't be building more housing in transit. Um, it's good for our housing stock. It's good environmentally. It's good for transit. It's better for our roads. It's less people are on them. Um, but there are things in there, again, that worry certain groups in Southern California in regards to That's where my SB50 comment stops. <laughs> and um, gentrification is a very, very, it's just a loaded word. And a lot of the times we hear about the negative of gentrification and things of that matter. But on its face, in its, you know, in its Webster's definition, gentrification is not a bad thing. Um, everybody in here would like it if their neighborhood was improved tomorrow. They would just like it if they could stay. And that's the, that is where gentrification, gentrification becomes um, misused 
and it becomes a harmful practice. Um, it, it will happen. I'm not sure how familiar everybody in here is with opportunity zones that came out in some federal tax plan, but a lot of the concerns there are that it will expedite the speed up gentrification and a lot of um, underinvested communities. Um, but at the end of the day, I think, again, it, it goes back to the way that we've structured our society that allows people to, to participate in our housing market, and it goes back to our policy that puts in affordability requirements um, for certain areas, and they can't be all concentrated in uh, East LA and South LA and Compton, because you know, at some point they would like to have some market rate housing, and at some point the people that have been living in in Compton and own that land, and you know, to an extent, they deserve to have the the land improved, or so I'm gonna say gentrified. But again, we we have to find a way as a um, as a city and as a society to do that without the displacement. Mm -hmm. okay. Next question. How do we ensure that the amenities needed to live well while living densely, example, public parks, transit, good public transportation, are provided if we eliminate single family zoning? I don't think, oh, I think I can address this. I don't think it's a um, give take. We don't have to, we don't have to take a park to build an apartment building. Of course, you don't have to eliminate a, an amenity to, um, um, to have single family housing. One of the things that helps add value to, and the reason that apartment buildings became a part of my career is because it just scale, but it's the same families, the same you know, um, income levels, and the, the, the thing that I became an expert at is amenity, you know, bringing amenities. What amenities can I bring? <clears throat> okay, what about fast Wi-Fi? What about you know, a power in, in, I would do this with my architect. Okay, we're gonna do all this pretty stuff. I said, but how many, how many electric plugs are in the house? Because in the 50s, there was only one in the kitchen, one in the dining room, and one in the hallway. What, what about 20? You know, kids have six devices these days. So you can put amenities in places that are an updated, you know, living condition versus whatever, you know, um, traditionally you would have a park, which is fine, but we, what people want is a Amazon exchange location in the lobby of their apartment building. So they can drop their packages off and get their packages. They want an Uber pickup. They want the fact that they can get a what all those electric scooters are called. <laughs> you can you can you can have amenities and have dense living. You can have amenities and have you know an updated, comfortable living situation because you're getting feedback from millennials and, and the elderly population and the professional population. You're just getting feedback from 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 all you know inhabitants there. And the irony is that if we keep only single family houses, many of them are due to Prop 13, they're not paying much property tax to fund this local public thing, you know, good, good public amenity. And so if you allow that to be subdivided into a couple of units, then maybe it'll, it'll trigger a reevaluation, a revaluation, or if you build a new small apartment there, that's a new property that's worth a certain amount and start, you start getting more money into the coffers. Mm -hmm. And then it's up to have a you know effective local government that actually invests in good infrastructure, and also that takes account of the fact that some communities, as we discussed, don't have as many parks or libraries or you know good commercial things, and but like focus is investment in places that need it. And then you're building up the development to take money and make a better society. And, and in the, from the policy perspective, it, it needs to be driven by the community. The community needs to say on Wednesdays, okay, there's. You know, now there used to be a hundred single family homes here, now there's a thousand units. Well, why don't we have a farmer's market here? Why don't we have, you know, the, the food truck festival here in the summertime for the, you know, kind of section off the blocks? I mean, there's so many different creative ways, but the not in my backyard and the old narrative of, you know, I, I've lived here forever and we've always done this this way, is, is it needs to be updated. And of course, we see this in, in, in the economy now, there's a lot of disruption going on. I mean, you got. VRBO and Airbnb. I mean, something's going to happen to disrupt the status quo anyway. The not in my backyard is not a good uh, 
um, defense to, to static, you know, to, to things remaining the same. Because disruption is going to come from the private sector or somewhere else. Okay, next question. Who lives in single family units today? Do we know? Demographic breakdown, et cetera. Um, the, the numbers are out there. I, I will admit off the top, I'm not an expert in them, uh, in single family units because we don't really deal with that very much. Uh, we deal with um, a lot of small, medium, multifamily housing, um, other large scale development. But I do know the numbers of, or the demographics that live in the small, medium, multifamily housing units are a majority minority, just like mm -hmm. the city. Um, there's no surprise there. It, it is what you think. Um, in, a, in a very lazy way, you could generalize who lives in a single family home, in what neighborhood, and how long the house has been in the family, and you probably wouldn't be too far off. Um, but speaking directly to the single family occupancy demographics, um, we just don't deal with it um, on a day to day basis, so I couldn't nail that for you. This one says, for Joss, can Brady be the writing? <laughs> can you give us some details on Enterprises program in the LA area, particularly how very LA extremely something something breakdown? several program leads, again, on policy, so I'm high level with all of them. So if I miss anything here, please get my contact and get a specific question, I'll get that for you. Um, but since 1997, Enterprise has invested in over a billion dollars in this region, so Southern California. Uh, because we are based in LA, a lot of our focus is Los Angeles, Los Angeles County. And in terms of the um, low, the very low income, even homeless population, we focus a lot on the um, coordinated entry system um, from to get people from the streets and homelessness to get them through services to eventually place them in a house. Um, a lot of our grant partners that we issue grants to are uh, agencies like Skid Row Housing Trust, and we allow a lot of our boots on the ground organizations to do that service work, um, just because that's not our that's not our charge, and that's really not the, the basis on which our company was founded and has continued to excel. Um, we are, we come into a lot of these situations from a, uh, a financial standpoint. And I say that to say we will invest in a property that is going to go to court um, our core values, which are going to be affordable, low income, extremely low income, uh, housing units and developers. We also have a program that focuses on single room occupancy units. And right now there's a lot of conversation um, with the city of LA and other municipalities in the area and in the county about whether or not we need to be preserving these units so that we can retain the housing stock because again, we don't want to lose any units. Uh, but because they're so, they're so old and they're so dated, um, would it be worth our time to essentially scrap it and, and rebuild it in a more modern sense to where at least they're a run bedroom facility or studio or they have their own bathroom and kitchen. So if you're not familiar with a, S, uh, a single room occupancy unit, we call them SROs, um, consider it a dorm room. And there's a shared, shared uh, bathroom, shared kitchen facility. And I've actually spoken to a lot of people in these areas and their issue doesn't always stem from, I just want more space. It stems from the poor management and the poor maintenance of these a lot of them are so old that you can't put uh, a disabled person in them with their wheelchair. Because it's just, one, it's a space issue, in and out, turning around in the unit. Um, but other than that, it's, it's problems like, you know, everybody eats dinner at five and you have one stove top. 
type of thing. Um, so that's a lot of the work. That's some of the stuff that we're we're primarily interested in. Um, that homelessness, our VP in our office was um, chaired the ad hoc committee on black people experiencing homelessness, which was commissioned by Los Angeles Homeless Services Authority, which is joint powers between the county and the city. And so we, we're looking at this from homeless services, getting people off the street, providing permanent supportive housing, preserving that housing, single room occupancy, up until um, we're, we're, we're financing units, um, you know, 60 units, 150 units, whether it be in Long Beach or, um, you know, Metro Path Villas that, that opened uh, downtown. So I know that was probably high level and if I maybe didn't touch the crux, but hopefully I got a little bit. No, the, the long I mean the short answer is no, and the long answer is I've, I've, I've had to move to other markets. I've you know much better success in Raleigh, Durham, North Carolina, Atlanta, Metro Atlanta area. Um, yeah, I was in Chicago, but that, that cold kicked my butt, so I had to come back to some <laughs> moderate weather. But anyway, uh, other markets, the density is easier to achieve. I'll try my best to read this. 1930 red mining. I'll just ask it because I, I don't Thank have you. the best. Um, That's okay. <laughs> <laughs> I don't, yeah, especially for the fans. This is more towards you because um, you, you kind of broke down the history of, of the red mining. Um, well, again, you don't, federal, well, pol all policy, especially tax policy, housing policy, things that affect us on a day-to-day -day basis are, again, designed to influence and our behavior. It persuades us to do things like buy a home on a 30-year mortgage. It dissuades us from doing things like buying cigarettes and having an additional $6 tax on tax, right? So you don't have to push white flight. It was the thing that made sense if you could take advantage of white flight. You know that you can avail yourself of this 30 year mortgage. You know that there are homeowner programs that the federal government is essentially going to subsidize. Mm -hmm. They're encouraging it, they're building the homes. You can buy a home at the time in Pennsylvania for six grand, right? You, they are saying, here's, here's, this, here's the case, come have a slice. But for these people that have no, no other option, they don't have any, one, their job's not gonna be in the suburbs, because again, the zone, they're not gonna zone that factory work in that suburb around those homes. Mm -hmm. um, they're gonna keep them in urban, densely populated areas. They don't have the wealth that they've been building over any period of time. They're living check to check. Uh, their health is deteriorating, so their, their life is getting more expensive. Their quality of life is decreasing, right? General, generational, mm -hmm. to an extent. So again, wasn't pushing them out, but if I'm a, if I'm a, you know, just going back to the, the map of the Bronx, right? If I'm a, a wealthy investment banker, you know, in Westchester County in New York, a little bit upstate outside of the city, there is absolutely no reason for me to move back into the city, to the Bronx. Air quality is atrocious. Um, it's, it's overpopulated. It's crowded. It's dim. It's, you know, it's the it's the ugly part of the city on a cartoon. You know, that's really what it is. But you're also telling me. I can, I can get a house for 10000 and I can pay it off over 30 years. I'm going to do that. You know, so it, it really wasn't a force. It was, it was simply, here's a really good opportunity if you're one of the people that it was designed for. And so that stems white flight. Now, white flight, um, again, sped up a lot of the issues in the city. So hopefully that answers your question. Last question. What is the current policy about allowing more than one house on a lot in LA County? I can kind of address that generally. Um, Mayor Garcetti is um, 
supposedly the development mayor and he's allowing a lot of uh, permits to be fast tracked. There's a lot, there's a bottleneck of permits at the Department of Building and Safety and the permits are to, um, to change the zoning and create entitlements to build more density and, and, and change different, um, change different, uh, the, the zone, the legacy zone. But it's, there's still a problem because what exactly needs to happen is it needs to be sped up. It needs to be fast tracked in a way that, you know, I wouldn't put myself in, in a project that needs entitlement because interest rates change, markets change, the economy changes by the time you get to the entitlement process, which could be three or four years. So, you know, the apocalypse could happen and the new, you know, the president could be in jail. I mean, no, it's, it's serious. But so it, there's, it needs to be a month, 30 days, two months to, to entitlement process to get, you know, to, to get projects off the ground and up and, and you know, to change things. In the single family properties, the state passed laws in late 2016 to in theory allow accessory dwelling units on most, on many properties. Um, so your illegal one could be brought to be legal and you could in some cases convert a structure or build a new one. Now cities still have the ability to screw around with those rules either by setting aside some portion of their city where it doesn't apply or charging high fees or having other like in the city of LA, if you have a DWP easement for a power line, you essentially can't convert a garage because there's liability issues. So in a whole bunch of ways, or, or they or Pasadena would like to say, your property has to be 7,500 square feet. So this tradition, the standard 5,000 square feet property, you're, you can't do it, right? So there needs to be more reforms to do that, but it's a good example of how state preemption forced cities to finally, after 100 years, say, in many places, it makes sense to have a second unit for renting or for having your family in it or whatever. And it's a good example of what the state can do when it comes into forces cities to do a little bit better and allow more. So you, you kind of have single family zoning is kind of two in many cases, but it depends on the jurisdiction. on the thought that, um, you know, this may seem, you know, really um, like an awful situation. You know, it's going to require so much work to undesign this history. Um, but if it was easy, then what we're doing now wouldn't be necessary. And so I think, you know, this is so important what we're doing here. And everybody that came here um, is going to be a part of the solution. So thank you again for being for being here and for um, you know helping us examine this history and these issues, um, and don't forget to sign up um, in the on the list before you leave, so that um, you know we can add you to our newsletter and just let you know about um, upcoming housing uh, issues that you can get involved with. So thank you again.